Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll just give a couple more minutes for people to slowly log in. Go. Starting to get a few more now. I'll get started slowly, everyone. And um, by the time everyone else gets here, I'm sure we will be into the really important stuff. So, welcome. Thank you all for coming to our MANA Institute uh, Research Project Opportunity Seminar. Um, and this is something that we plan to hold um, at least once a year around the time that we're starting to think about new projects for students, um, but we might hold it at other times as well. So thank you for coming along to our first session. And uh, let me make sure these slides are working. So firstly, I would like to, um, or the Manor Institute would like to respectfully acknowledge the First Nations people as the continuing custodians of this continent and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. This institute honours their rich cultural heritage, beliefs and enduring relationship to the lands and communities in which we all live, learn and work. Um, and this is our, our um, co-designed acknowledgement of country from our First Nations um, advisory group. I am coming to you from the lands of the Yuggera and the Garipal people in Springfield and Ipswich in Queensland, and I'm sure you are all coming from various rich um, areas around Australia. I think we've got quite a good range of, of representation here. We would also like to acknowledge that there are a lot of conversations occurring in our community and society at the moment that can be quite distressing and, and also our, our work does touch on mental health more broadly, so we would like to um, also acknowledge that our institute is dedicated to addressing those mental health needs and appreciate that at times that that can be especially challenging and encouraging people to reach out where they need. So whilst this seminar today is, is not really about learning what matter is in terms of its structures and, and procedures, you will learn that through some of the projects that we're talking about today. So I just wanted to start with a very brief introduction as to um, what manner is doing. And MANA is a um, combination of the regional young run, sorry, the regional university network, um, the universities that, that make up that network, along with our amazing partner institutions. And we've all come together with, a, I guess, a joint focus on building place-based research capacity to improve mental health in regional, rural and remote Australia. So we're all located in regional and rural areas, and we really think it's, it's our duty to, to help inform and shape how mental health um, is, is addressed and, the, and improve the outcomes in these areas. Incredibly fortunate to have a large group of people um, come together in this institute, many of whom are on the Zoom call today, so you'll have your chance to speak if you want to. And really what the institute is doing is working with some key groups. So we've got our, our researchers, which is our academics in our university settings. We have some amazing industry and service providers. Um, and, and this includes Lifeline Direct and Every Mind, and, and we're growing by the day. We have amazing lived experience and community members who are contributing to our work, either through directly informing our research, participating in our research, and becoming students as well. And our partner universities as well through ANU. University of Newcastle. And together what we're trying to do is build regional mental health research workforce capacity and improve the trajectories in, in these areas. So what we wanted to do today is really come together and give you an idea of what sort of projects we actually have on offer at the moment. So we're looking at a large range of um, projects that are led by researchers, our ECRs, our MCRs, our, our PhD students even. And we're looking to invite as many people as possible to come on board with those projects and help us improve and increase the relevance of that to our communities. So that's the purpose of today's seminar, to um, go through our research projects on offer. And I've got 19 MANA research projects on offer at the top, but actually there's 20 because I forgot one. And my apologies for that, you know who you are. And um, 
today is an opportunity for us and some of our researchers are here to talk through some of these research projects. So MANA is aiming to research across a number of, of areas. We're looking at um, workforce, we're looking at individual mental health uh, needs and wellbeing, we're looking at community-based um, mental health, and we're also looking at the impacts of um, natural disasters and environment and things like that. The projects on offer today, I've grouped them according to their, their focus areas. And so our focus areas within MANA might change, but ultimately are looking at addressing and improving mental health outcomes for our regional areas um, and looking at various priority populations and, and workforce issues. So today we're going to go through a number of projects around older adults and dementia prevention. And we've got some speakers here who are going to talk to their projects. Um, we've got a number of projects around mental health needs and services, uh, whether this be looking at um, population level or at the individual group level. And we have a number of projects around workforce and education. And finally, a large stream on children, adolescents and families. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to work our way through these projects. We actually do have a nice extensive booklet that we can send to you all. And so at the end, there's a QR code that you can scan. You can pop your email address in. Um, to receive a copy of that booklet. So today the presentation is more about just getting to know the people and getting to know the projects a bit, but there's much more detail in the, in the booklet for you. What we're also going to do today as we go through each of these projects is highlight what type of students this might be relevant for or what type of partners who might want to take on student projects or internships and um, whether or not there's any particular scholarships that are attached to those projects and the types of um, team members involved and the university institution. So some projects have to be conducted through a particular university because they might have a, a scholarship attached to it and others might be a little bit more flexible. So as a whole, our seven universities plus our partner universities are coming together to try and collaborate. So we're aiming to be as flexible as possible and helping people get involved in research that they can. So what we might do is um, possibly we can put questions in the chat as people are going through and presenting. And when that person's finished speaking, they might be able to address those um, questions. Otherwise, we'll hold off the verbal questions until the end of the session today. So we're first going to talk a little bit about our older adults and dementia prevention projects that are on offer. And I'm going to throw to our speakers where we have them here. And sometimes I'll present some of the projects for people. So can I invite Prajwal, please, to um, discuss this project briefly? And we'll just take a, a couple of minutes, Praj, to, to work through this project. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Sonia, and thanks for this opportunity. My name is Prajwal. I am a lecturer in UNESQ and a member of a Center for Health Research in Queensland. I am a stroke researcher. I am very much interest in, interested in stroke recovery research. So when a patient experience a stroke, they are rushed to the hospital and an acute stroke team uh, manages a patient uh, and do some acute treatment. But after the initial management of this patient, these stroke survivors are referred to a stroke rehabilitation unit. So basically the integrated care pathways is that they come to the emergency, they go to the acute stroke unit, and these survivors are referred to the stroke recovery unit. But these integrated care pathways are very fragmented in a regional, remote, and rural setting. And most importantly, when a patient, when a stroke survivor are referred to the stroke rehabilitation unit, the whole focus is on the motor disabilities, the visible disabilities of the patient. Like uh, stroke survivors cannot move their hand, arm, legs, they are speech disorders. So it is a focus, but there is something more in patient like which are not visible, but patient are experiencing. These are called invisible obstacles, invisible disabilities like stress, fatigue, cognitive function. And these invisible obstacles like stress, fatigue, cognitive function are shown to have a huge effect on the quality of life of stroke survivors. They, they, they decide how the quality of the life of the stroke survivors are going to be in the next two, three or four years. And they also affect the stroke recovery trajectory. So 
the team, our team at Center of Health Research, Darling Downs Health, UniSQ are focused on targeting these invisible obstacles so that we can improve the quality of life of the patient. And as I said, there is not much intervention to target these invisible obstacles. So first thing we need to do is we need to co-design the intervention in a partnership with multi, multidisciplinary allied health team like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, clinical psychologist, speech pathologist, biomedical scientist, neurologist, neurointerventionist, stroke nurse. And that is our target. We are co-designing it with a multidisciplinary allied health team including stroke survivors, stroke carers, and the hospital executives. So that is the first phase of this PhD project. And once we co-design the intervention that is feasible and acceptable and that aligns with our regional need, then we pilot this intervention in the Darling Downs Health and Westmorton Health. So this is a complete PhD package and there is no, the scholarship is not guaranteed, but since the stroke is a, is, a, is a priority and it falls under a health flagship research area, you are very much eligible to apply for a UniSQ PhD scholarship. And I'm happy to help you on that process as well. So if you want to make a change in the stroke people life, stroke survivors life, if you want to change the policy, if you want to impact the health system in stroke, please join our team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Praj. That's excellent. And can I just encourage um, people, if you have a specific question for Praj, please pop it in the chat and we'll open up to, to broader questions at the end. So each of these slides is going to follow, now that you've seen this, is going to follow a same um, format and have information about the types of uh, requirements that, that might be helpful for a student and whether it's a PhD project or an honours project. But that information is also covered in the booklet. So don't worry too much if you don't see it all, as well as things like uh, whether the student can work externally or whether they need to be on, on campus. So our Darling Downs region here in the West Morton region is expected to have a 50% increase in the um, older adults in the next few years. So this is a hugely important um, area for us. So thank you so much, Praj. We're going to move on to the next project. Um, so Dan, you've had a nice um, introduction to, to this now. So I will hand over to you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Dan Wadsworth. I'm up here on the Sunshine Coast. You can see our beach behind. Um, our campus is not only based at the beach in Sippy Downs, though we have campuses reaching much more into the regional Queensland space, um, for example, in Gympie and up on the Fraser Coast. Um, my research interest bears out of that and relates to MANA because I'm really interested in ways that we can design accessible and appropriate supports for the health and well-being of older adults and university students. And this project is a great example of both of those things. So um, it's actually born out of some work that my colleagues, including Dr. Alison Craswell, did um, last year where they got a student to live in intergenerational home share in an aged care facility up in Gympie. And so out of that, we um, you know, sparked a few fires and thought, well, let's look at expanding it further. Up on the Sunshine Coast at the moment, we have a couple of really pertinent issues, one of which is around older adults wanting to age in place, but really struggling to access the care supports that support them to do that. There could be waits of up to 12 months to get the home care package that you want to get, even if you are successfully able to navigate the horrendous systems that you need to to get that support. Um, and secondly, we have an accommodation and a rental crisis, much like other parts of Australia, but up here on the coast, it's really pronounced. Our rent has gone up by over a third um, in the last 12 months. And one of the most impacted groups there is our student cohort. They're a transient cohort. They don't always have a lot of money. Um, but what we do know is that social connection is a really important determinant of our mental health, our physical health, our well-being, and it's also an important determinant of future dementia risk. And so this project aims to look at addressing all of those things together in one. We, you know, very small hopes. Um, and to, for this particular stage of the project, we've got some partnership and some funding with the Sunshine Coast Council and with Suncare Community Services to do a bit of a scoping review of what's currently around in the intergenerational home share space. And then much like Pradwell, to do a co-design process to co-create the framework for a future um, intergenerational home share program that we aim to pilot and deliver here on the Sunshine Coast. So although we said this is a master's project, you know, there's a scope for this to continue on to actually 
pilot test and develop and refine what we do, what we produce out of this particular first phase of the project. We have a stipend with this project built into the funding. So we have a $10,000 stipend, um, which is a nice carrot for people to come along. Um, and the project would be led by myself and my colleague, Dr. Alison Craswell here at UniSC. I'm also a postdoc fellow here at the Manor Institute. We have a couple of other UniSC researchers. And then, as I said, a number of industry um, partners on the project too. And I believe I'm also going to tell you a little bit about our next project as well, Sonia. Well, I'm going to call for you. There you go. So I'm also presenting this project on behalf of my colleague at UniSC and at MANA, um, Dr. Mia Schornberg. Mia is currently overseas on sabbatical in Sweden, so she's asleep at the moment. Um, it's a bit unfair to get her up for this one. Um, Mia and I lead the Active Aging Research Group here at USC. So trying to find things that encourage and help older adults to be physically active and socially connected as a means of reducing their chronic risk disease, or their risk of chronic disease. And dementia, as you may have already guessed, is a particular focus of our group. And um, we have a number of projects around that already, particularly looking for a rural and regional lens as a group of people who are um, you know, otherwise minority and disadvantaged, and underrepresented in research. And another one of those groups that Mia is particularly interested in is the uh, postmenopausal women or the influence of the menopause around um, dementia and dementia risk. And so this project would be a PhD project. And much like Pradwell's project, it doesn't have a scholarship attached to it, but what it does have is um, the capacity to um, access our RTP or our research training scholarship. And through this project, you'll be work coming into an established base of research. There's already one PhD and one master's student who are looking specifically at the dementia risk in um, postmenopausal or perimenopausal is probably the better term because we look at what's happening before, during and after the menopause and how that may influence um, the chances of you developing dementia as you continue to age. Again, like the project I previously talked about and the one that Pradra mentioned earlier, um, engagement with community and really understanding the needs of the people that you're working with is a key part of it. So as well as there being hands-on uh, quantitative data measures, there's going to be a lot of face-to-face -face discussion and community inter interaction. Those parts are really important elements of our, our projects. Thank you, Dan. Excellent. You're welcome. So we've got quite a, a few great projects happening in the in the older adults and dementia prevention space or management of conditions in older adults as well. Um, and I think what's really clear is that they're quite big teams that you'll be embedded in and you'll get a lot of different multidisciplinary experience. So some really great projects there. Again, encourage you to pop any questions for, for Dan and Praj in the in the chat and we will we'll keep going through and, and there'll be more information in the booklet. So our next grouping of topics, if you like, is mental health needs and, and services in regional and, and rural areas. So trying to understand more about what is maybe unique about uh, individuals in communities living in regional areas and, and how this might shape their mental health needs and their service needs. So we've got quite a few projects in this um, area. And the first comes from our, our partner institution, Australian National University. And Phil, if I can hand over to you for the next couple, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so we've got a couple from ANU, which could be done at ANU or could be done um, at a regional university in conjunction with MANA um, and uh, having Alison and myself or both of us involved in sort of supervision of the project. So we do a lot of work around uh, help seeking, how people engage with professional um, services, as well as how they uh, people disclose or recognize that they have a mental health problem. And then the sort of interplay between formal and informal sources of support. Uh, so there hasn't been a lot of work done in this area, understanding some of these the barriers and enablers of help seeking such as stigma and mental health literacy, as well as sort of the structural barriers to engaging with mental health services. Uh, that I mean, there's been a lot of work done in that space, but not so much done specifically in the regional and rural area. So um, there's a potential, um, um, I'm looking at the wrong project, aren't I? So, sorry, could you just skip to the next one, then we'll go backwards, sorry. Um, 
So uh, there's a potential PhD project um, or a master's project breaking off some of this in terms of developing a fairly comprehensive framework or model of how people engage with mental health services, as well as how that interface between sort of informal and formal sources and disclosure processes uh, within rural areas and identifying some of the gaps between need and, and service availability. Um, and that could be part of a MANA scholarship or an RTP scholarship. Um, so going back a slide, sorry, Sonia. Um, the other project um, is looking at um, factors associated with mental health in um, that are specific to rural areas. So some obviously some factors are general to mental health across reg rural, regional and urban areas, but there may be some specific factors that impact on specific mental health conditions in rural areas. So we have some large da population data sets um, of um, th three over 3,000 participants. We've got two different data sets that have measures of different mental health outcomes, as well as many of the factors that may underlie um, mental ill health. Um, so we haven't really looked at whether there are differences in those factors that underlie uh, mental health uh, in rural areas compared to, to urban areas. So, th so this could be um, either a, an honours project, it's sort of a fairly contained piece of work, or uh, a research master's project. And happy to take questions online. Thank you, Phil, and my apologies, I moved that new that one I missed into the first spot. Um, so thank you for that. So some really important work needing to understand um, the risk factors and also things that, that interplay with help seeking in, in our regional populations. Just going to address a question that was popped in the chat um, because it applies more broadly. So each project will be different in terms of its student requirements. So the projects that, for example, have... Um, are, are suitable for an honours or a research master's student would need the degree up until the entry to that point. So for an honours, they'd need to have completed the undergraduate degree before the honours. If they were looking to, if they were looking to do a research master's, they would have had to complete a relevant degree before that. But there are some where we've called capstone projects, which are smaller projects that can happen as part of an undergraduate degree. So the answer will depend on the project, Phil. Um, thank you for that question. Okay, so um, I did see Jasleen join, I think. Um, so I might hand over to you, Jasleen, if that's okay for a discussion around this yes. one. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Sonia, sorry. I was just in a meeting and I just finished that and I jumped quickly onto this one. So I do apologize for my uh, late coming to the meeting, um, but happy to discuss about this project. We are at Federation University looking at um, exploring the factors which are related to help seeking behaviors um, in men. And the, we're looking at specific mental health, health disorders, specifically PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And I can see one of my students, Tyler, is also here, um, who is actually currently doing his uh, master's project on clinical master's thesis on this project. So we have already collected some data, but I'm keeping going to keep the data open. So uh, any new student who plans to join this project can help more with the data collection and also get some experience. Um, so we already have some definite variables, as I said, PTSD, depression, anxiety, but we are also looking at masculinity. We're also looking at self-stigma. How does that influence help-seeking behavior? Um, we're looking at perceived stigma. So not only self-stigma, but also perceived stigma. We're also looking at attitudes towards help-seeking um, from um, professionals, from, uh, for, for example, psychologists um, and psychiatrists. So these are some of the variables we are exploring. Um, this is currently built up as a honors or a research project. So it's an ongoing project, but I'm happy for other students to join in and get some experience with the data collection. Fabulous, thank you, Jasleen. I know you've got another project, I just can't remember which order, so we'll work our <laughs> way through. But again, um, pop any questions for Jasleen in, in the chat, please. Um, all right. So our next projects are coming over to CQU um, and I'm not sure who wants to talk to this, but Chris, I'm thinking maybe you, if you'd like to, to talk about this project. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just trying to get my head in order. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm Chris Doran. I'm a health economist working with Nana. CQU do a lot of stuff um, with interdisciplinary research. So this one relates to activity three. I've been uh, trying to develop a toolkit and dashboard 
to work with our foundation partners, in particular Lifeline Direct, Lifeline, um, to develop a toolkit and dashboard that will roll out um, to other sites, including EveryMind, who's another foundation partner. So that it sort of relates to developing data asset and toolkit. So what we mean by a toolkit, it's um, a set of tools designed to be used together or for a particular purpose. It could comprise data to inform decision-making um, instruments, depending upon the needs of the, of the client to actually um, improve, understand, monitor, do all that stuff in terms of improving mental health. Um, the, the toolkit could encompass a whole range of um, evidence-based strategies. So the whole idea of this is to um, inform best evidence, really, and provide a way in which our partners might be able to implement evidence-based community services to address the needs of their population. So the dashboard, you've probably seen dashboards before. There's a whole heap of dashboards that have been popping up over the last few years. And even if you go to a mechanic or um, private insurance, there's dashboards that sort of look at the pros and cons of different approaches depending upon what you want to do. So it's the same sort of thing with what we're trying to do with this um, data asset as well, is to just provide a better understanding of what data is out there, um, provide an automated system by which we can collect, monitor, and report that data back to the services for continuous quality improvements. So essentially, when we started to get into this project, we realised there was, there's not much information out there. So I think that the time is right to undertake um, a study that could encompass um, a small scale honors project ranging from um, a review of the literature around toolkits and dashboard all the way up to a, a PhD in terms of um, looking at what's relevant for service providers, engaging with different stakeholders such as primary health networks or suicide prevention Australia or mental health organisations. They actually look at you know, how the data that's been collected informs national reporting or national standards. So. There's no scholarship, it's just an idea at this stage. Um, there are opportunities to tap into some project funding um, that MENA offers. Sonia, I probably should have checked that first because I, I think there's um, a little bit of seed funding each year for projects within MENA, she's shaking her head. So there is opportunity for small scale projects um, and at the top of the tree, you know, if people are interested, reach out. We might be able to tap into a PhD scholarship somewhere down the path as well. So I hope that sort of provides a bit of an overview of what that project's all about. That's great, Chris. Thank you. And I, I mean, I think some of the project funds that we have could make perfect little summer vacation scholarships or, or things like that. So there's always opportunities that we can investigate um, depending on, on the projects and the students' needs. So yeah, good, good for pointing that out. Thank you, Chris. Again, questions for Chris in the chat and we'll keep going and have, have a discussion at the end. Um, you may have another one though, Chris. Yeah. Um, yes, you do, keep going. Yeah, so again, I'm a health economist, so economics, quantitative stuff, if people are interested in, in this area, it sort of comes from um, some of the work I've been doing with mates in construction that do a lot of suicide prevention stuff in the construction industry, they also, um, expanding to mining, manufacturing, but also working in New Zealand and looking at expanding in the UK. So MATES is a different funding source that I've talked to a few people about. But as I get into that literature to have a look at what's the potential cost of suicidal behaviour in the construction industry, because we know different industries have elevated risks of harm and suicide. So policy people really want to understand the economics, um, being counting, to a certain extent of what it costs, a bit like the burden of disease and the potential impact of workplace strategy. So MATES is a workplace strategy. So a lot of it comes from that. Um, the Productivity Commission have just done a big study into mental health in Australia and they, they had a chapter or an appendix on um, the economic costs of mental health. And it's pretty rough and ready. There's not much information out there. So. Again, the, the timing is right for somebody to come on board to sort of develop a career out of this in the context of looking at mental health. So MANA is all about rural remote mental health. There's next to nothing known about the economic costs associated with mental health in regional Australia. So again, how long is a piece of string? You could do a student 
um, summer scholarship on this one, or you could build a PhD. I had a postdoc, um, Irena Kinchin, who's now in the UK, continuing work along this space, but that's a real niche area. Um, there's not much known, and there's a potential um, opportunity to work with the industry in a positive way to inform policy. I'll leave it there, Sonia. Thank you, Chris. Excellent. So some important work that needs to be done. And like um, Chris said, there's you know room here for people to make a career out of this. So um, please reach out to Chris if you are interested in this type of area. Okay. Um, I would now like to hand over to Tracy um, to talk about this amazing project. Thank you, Sonia, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, this project was born out of um, the desire to develop or co-design an intervention in regional areas. We conducted some formative work with stakeholders and we asked them what they thought the main issues were in their towns. And the towns we're focusing on is Oki and Toowoomba in the Darling Downs. And this was because we often as researchers say mental health is an issue or obesity is an issue. With this, we took a step back and we said to the community, what do you think the, the main concerns are for your communities? Well, it came out that they said mental health and obesity were, were their main concerns. And some of them um, were concerned about the relationship between those two health outcomes. So for example, um, the housing crisis impacts on people's opportunities to um, eat healthy foods and prepare healthy foods. So we've started that process. The next phase of this study is where we will conduct town hall meetings or yarning circles or community workshops with people in the community and build on that. So we are using systems thinking. And so what that means is we'll ask the community to think about the factors or determinants of mental health and obesity and how they interlink. And we will then create what's called causal loop diagrams and ask the community to um, highlight the priority areas where they think we can act and, and influence these behaviors. And then the next study would be actually looking at the implementation of those priority actions. These um, priority actions will largely be implemented by the community because the other thing that's come out of our formative work is don't come in here and do stuff for us. You need to empower us as the community. So this is quite a big program of work. Um, it suits a PhD student. The PhD student can choose to focus on some of what I've described, but also looking at other outcome measures like social connectedness and, and sense of ownership, um, sense of community and, and belonging. Um, I am targeting a First Nation student, um, and essentially it's someone with an undergraduate degree in public health or mental health or physical activity and exercise. So it is actually quite a broad base from which to choose. And because we are engaging with the community and we want to be authentic, um, ideally the student should be based in the Darling Downs region. And there is a scholarship available um, for the student. So, please contact me if you are interested and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and just to, to clarify with that one, that's a full PhD stipend for the three years plus a, a top up from Manor as well. So um, really keen to, to find somebody on that project. Plus an um, amazing team. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. This is excellent. We've got so many awesome projects that um, we're getting up and running and keen to get everybody involved. Um, even if you're not interested as a student or not able as a student, but you might like to collaborate, please reach out to, to the investigators and you'll you'll see their information and their email addresses in the in the booklet as well. So we're powering through um, and I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for, for questions. So we'll we'll keep going with the projects and, and try and kick to our two-minute descriptions. Um, our next section is mental health workforce and education. Now, um, a big component of MANA is really a trying to understand and build capacity of our mental health workforce, not, not limited um, to psychologists or psychiatrists, but very broadly thinking about our workforce and educators in this space and how we can improve regional mental health capacity. 
So we'll go through these ones here. And Marg, can I invite you to please give a, a little description of your project? Sure, thanks, Sonia. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, so this one is about looking at early childhood educators. Now we know that the early childhood educator sector is in crisis at the moment, and that really affects all of society. It's not just about early learning, although that's very important, but it affects um, families in rural, regional and remote Australia to be able to work and live and to be able to access um some really important mental health information and referrals um, for their children if there's any uh, learning um, challenges or mental health issues themselves. It also allows for screening. So what we're doing is trying to empower educators to help them to stay because we know that the attrition rates um, in rural, regional and remote areas are scary for uh, um, for, so uh, educators tend to, to leave the areas very quickly um, because they're really used as a quasi mental health support person because often people in these areas, families can't really find mental health workers to support them. So our project looks at a peer support mentoring program that's been very successful in uh, Canada and it's really uh, doing well in British Columbia over there. We will be adapting it and um, implementing it in five locations um, in a pilot that's been funded and in uh, rural, regional and remote um, Queensland. And then we're going to be um, working with the educators. So there'll be focus groups, there'll be before and after baseline um, and um, post-intervention uh, measurements. Um, there'll also be interviews and students, depending on um, what level they're at, they can really get involved with this. There'll be lots of data uh, and lots of fun working to support early childhood educators. Um, UNE offers um, HDR scholarships uh, and there's also um, obviously um, the um, New South Wales uh, Department of Education Waratah Scholarship. She could be eligible for that as well. Um, it could be for an honours, a capstone or a research master's. Um, if you're interested in um, the mental health of in education of educators, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Marg. Sounds like a, a lot of opportunities in different areas across that program. So please pop any questions for, for Marg in the chat as well. And um, thank you, Marg. Thank you. Continuing on um, in this theme of workforce and education, I'm actually going to pass over to Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, thanks, Sonia. Yeah, that's a wrap. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows that uh, most universities are in the process of developing a wrap or already have one. Um, but I'm wondering how they're going. So we have CQU, which is where I'm based. We have a very impressive wrap. It's a uh, 28 pages long and it's uh, very ambitious and detailed. So we have actions, we have deliverables, we have a timeline and we have who's responsible. So it's go, it dates from July 2022 to July 2024. Um, I'm quite proud of what, what it looks like um, symbolically. However, how is it going to go um, in practice? And that's what I'm really interested in. So I thought it would be helpful to have a look at the other run universities and have um, a bit of a benchmarking process in terms of um, looking at each other's uh, reconciliation action plans, what they involve and what they're hoping to achieve um, and what are the barriers and enablers. So it's a very, it's a very um, sparse idea at the moment, but you know, with the view perhaps in terms of what we find out from, from this toe in the water as to how we could expand this and perhaps look at wraps across Australia. Um, anyone interested, please touch base with me. Brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. Um, look forward to hearing how that one goes. And again, questions um, for Vicky in the chat, please. And, and even people from other run unis might want to collaborate as well, Vicky. So people reach out to anyone that you're interested in talking to further with. Yep, perfect. Okay, moving on to our next project number 12. 
Um, Cassie, you are here as well, aren't you? Yes, can I hand over to you, please? I am indeed. Hi, everybody. Um, just excuse my kind of throaty, stuffy voice. I'm on the tail end of a cold. Um, so I'm located at Seek University, like Chris and Vicky, but I'm located on the sunny but very windy Bundaberg campus. Um, so this particular project um, is has a nice alignment with Marg's project. In fact, and Marg gave a beautiful introduction and rationale to the importance of um, focusing on early childhood educators. But this particular project is looking, I suppose, more at their experiences in managing um, uh, difficult child behaviour in groups and classroom settings and how that might... Um, I suppose their, their, their confidence and self-efficacy in managing that, how well they receive training and support around behaviour management strategies and promoting pro-social behaviour and the influence on that on their job satisfaction and emotional well-being. So this project builds on some work I've had a previous honours and a previous um, clinical psychology master's student work on, where we already have some survey data collected. I'm looking to, I suppose, expand that survey data and particularly build um, more experiences from our regional rural remote early childhood educators uh, and to add a qualitative component, so likely interviews or focus groups. So that aspect of it would suit nicely an honours um, project, one or two honours students or a research master's project, and there's capacity for this to be built in as, I suppose, an initial study or two and a PhD, which could broaden out into um, more of an intervention um, piece as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and I know you, you've you got a bit of a cold, but I think you'll be speaking a bit more later. <laughs> Um, thanks, everyone. So um, the next project in this workforce and education setting is, um, I don't think Sarah is here, I'm about to speak on her behalf. Um, and if, yep, yeah, okay, I'll just go with this, Dan, um, and cover it for all of us. Um, so this, this particular project uh, that's on offer here is one that's going to be conducted in collaboration with Lifeline Direct. And as some of you may know, the university crisis lines um, are available to university students. And um, what we're hoping to do in this project is really examine that routinely collected data from the crisis line to understand um, what our regional university students' reasons are for seeking support. Um, trying to understand how the, the prevalence of mental health difficulties or the help seeking um, behaviours might differ between regional university students and metropolitan uh, students. So trying to work together to understand what mental health needs our regional university students have um, and what supports they are using and, and potentially the gaps there and, and what might be needed. So this is existing data and then potentially could build up into other projects. But at the moment, it would be suitable for a capstone project. So an undergraduate research placement, um, work integrated learning type placement or, or an honours student. So we'd be looking for people with any type of health science background, social work, psychology. Um, if you've worked with industry partners, that would be an added bonus. Um, and if you've had some time to play with some quantitative data, that would also be a bonus. But mostly just looking for people who are interested in this area and willing to, to give it a go. Um, so that's that particular project. Um, and I, again, pop any questions in the, in the chat for us. And what we're going to do now is move on to our final um, stream, which is children, adolescent and families. And we do have quite a number of projects in here, so we'll try and push through these and, and keep to, to our time so we can finish on time for everyone. I'm going to start off with Marg again. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so this one is a pro project that's looking at children from defence and so military and veteran families and also looking at uh, children from first responder and remote working families. So these families experience uh, parents working away for long periods of time. They often have um, stress that is um, vicarious stress coming in because of the types of work that their parents do. And they also might experience a parent who has 
um, a mental health condition or a physical um, con a health condition due to their service roles. Uh, so it is um, looking at uh, co-designing and co-creating res research-based resources for children, parents, uh, educators and support workers um, to better support them and evaluating um, those resources based on a mixed method approach. Um, if you uh, enjoy working an, in an area that would support uh, children and also the families, this would be a great project for you. Um, there's no end to, to how much you could um, put into this project um, right up to a PhD, but you could start with something smaller. Um, you'll be working with an online team, virtual team, and we're also um, starting to work with our EveryMind partners as well, which is very exciting. And we have many, many um, organisations that we partner with. It's an ongoing project, but you can choose parts that you you're very interested in. And there's um, scholarships available as listed there. Brilliant. Thank you, Marg. So um, great teams to work with there and, and some really interesting um, projects. Okay, Jasleen, if you want to give us a quick overview of, of this project. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'll do a very quick one. So this um, project, it is built for a PhD, um, as a PhD project. So we're looking at identifying barriers um, for men, especially dads in rural and remote areas in Australia, for them to access the mental health services. So there's a lot of research suggesting that what we have currently for dads is mostly focused on moms, even though they're invited to the therapy, it's more revolves around moms and their children and their babies, but it's not focusing directly on that. So the main idea is to develop an, inter, an intervention which is going to be directly engaging fathers. So we have got a few goals. So first of all is that we're gonna be planning to um, design an effective intervention, but we're gonna be using, um, we're gonna, it's gonna be built in partnership with not only um, the medical staff, but also we're gonna be engaging fathers with the community members. And we're gonna be also engaging service providers who are actually engaging dads over there. Um, this is, it, the project is kind of already built and it's an extension of my PhD. So I'm very excited and very passionate about it, um, but it retains enough flexibility that if a student wants to join in, you know, they can mold it in their own way. But again, the focus has to be on dads in rural and um, remote areas. Um, as mentioned, there will be RQP funding from Federation University, and there would be some seed funding from a MANA as well, possibly. And we have um, confirmed partnership from Telecom Kids. So the fathering project from the Telecom Kids would be a part of this project as well. And we're hoping um, to get our partners from Lifeline to be involved in this project as well. Um, as mentioned on the slide, it's open for collaboration with other MANA researchers. So would be happy for other uh, MANA academics to join um, the PhD supervision team. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Jasleen. And great to have that connection with um telephone as well. So excellent. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you, Cassie, for a few now. Just let me know when you want me to change the slides. Okay, for radio. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so this particular project stems from some work I've been doing in the last few years with um, the NRL in junior rugby league. Um, and so particularly relates to some challenges they were experiencing, not exclusive to rugby league, though, I've got to say, um, with the difficult and challenging spectator behaviour on the sideline from parents. <clears throat> um, so this has sort of led us down the track of um, we, we did a deep dive into rugby league and what was going on in that context, um, getting a sense of the types of behaviours that parents were engaging in on the sideline, but also more importantly, what were the kind of factors or influences on parents that were affecting them um, in that moment to behave in that particular way and how that was ex affecting children's experiences in sport. Um, so we're looking, I suppose, to broaden this out beyond rugby league into other sports contexts um, and as a, as a way, I suppose, a first step in sort of assessing what's going on um, is looking at other sports con sport contexts and sort of, I suppose, 
um, replicating what we did with the NRL in, in other sports. So um, soccer and basketball is um, one area or two sports that have been identified as well as tennis and some um, collaborators I have at UQ have um, partnerships with Tennis Australia. So we're really yeah, looking at trying to get a bit more information about what's going on with parents in sport, what are the factors that affect their behaviour in sport um, and how we might be able to, I suppose, modify that through um, any sort of support program or intervention um, to promote positive parenting in sport. So that's that one. Oh, and this one links, I suppose, also nicely to the, the things that, that Jasleen was talking about, but this is really focused, I suppose, on um, fathers in in that more, um, I don't want to say primary caregiving role, because I feel like that's a really redundant word these days, but fathers who are more directly involved either in a part-time or full-time capacity in caring for their, their young children. Um, so really getting a sense, particularly in reg regional and rural areas, which um, tend to have, I suppose, uh, more traditional gender roles when it comes to um, dads being the ones at work versus mums being the ones at home caring for children. Um, but we know that that is changing, that landscape is changing and more and more mums and dads are sharing those responsibilities. So this project would be um, qualitative in nature, really suitable for an honours or a research master's project, really um, interviewing dads who are in those sorts of roles to get a sense of their um, experiences and perspectives of what it's like to be um, a father when you're really involved um, in a in a sort of a, a primary or co-primary way with raising your young child. Um, and the end game is really, like Jasleen mentioned, um, so many of our parenting services are really mothering services, really. They, they you know, they're designed to be inclusive, accessible to mothers and not always to dads. Um, and even just sort of your light touch stuff, things that you have mothers groups <laughs> um, and play groups designed for mums and you don't really have that same thing for dads and dads often can feel quite isolated. So, you know, how can we use this information to feed back into, make sure these supports aren't for mum specifically or dad specifically, but for parents in general. Oh, and this one is a, a sort of another parenting related one. So this comes, um, I suppose, from I've been involved for a while in kind of the development and evaluation of um, evidence-based parenting programs. Um, and what we understand and know through sort of lots of research, but also um, you know, just anecdotal hands-on experience living and working in a regional community is that we have great evidence-based parenting programs, great evidence-based psychological programs generally, but parenting programs in this context. Um, but there's a real disconnect between what's going on in science and the literature versus what regional communities are actually delivering. Um, so this project would be Again, you could scope it as big as you want it. <laughs> um, it could be smaller. Um, it could even be a, a capstone project, potentially a sort of initial um, audit, but sort of a, a trying to get a snapshot or audit of what's going on in the delivery of parenting support um, to support child analysis and mental health in our, our areas. Um, and particularly whether services are offering evidence-based parenting support, whether services or um, practitioners are being trained to deliver evidence-based parenting support programs, or if perhaps they're delivering just sort of general family and parenting information that may or may not um, be evidence-based. So that's that one. Fabulous. Thank you, Cassie. So lots of important parenting research available, um, and I encourage you to reach out and pop any questions to Cassie in the chat as well. Brilliant. Um, so we've got two more projects to go through. Um, this one is one of mine and relates to an externally funded project that we um, uh, have started that is looking at um, models of digital care for child and adolescent anxiety. That, that are relevant to regional areas. So we've got some really great evidence-based um, 
approaches to anxiety uh, that, that use digital technologies. But we, we've also got a lot of qualitative um, feedback from regional families that they need things to be a little bit different for the regional settings. And so we're currently running a randomized control trial that is looking at finding that right model of care. Um, and this can be as simple as things like we know that in digital um, CBT for anxiety, child anxiety, that adding video conferencing, just short video conferencing sessions to our digital program gives us the absolute best efficacy, but a lot of families either can't access video conferencing because of their bandwidth, or they don't want to actually, because it's a bit difficult for them to have those regular times. And so we're looking at having options in how we deliver our support and different types of support. So telephone, SMS, um, whatever is, is needed by the regional communities. So we're looking for a PhD student or a research master student to come on board with this randomized control trial and have a look at some of the factors that might be related to outcomes in regional populations in this trial and, and what parts of the digital model work well and don't work so well for the regional context. I'd be really keen on this student doing a lot of qualitative work with the young people and their families and regional service providers as well. So looking for somebody who has an interest in both quantitative and, and um, qualitative research methods. Um, There'll be support through the external funding, but in terms of a scholarship, we'd be asking you to, if you were wanting a scholarship, to apply for a UniSQ um, scholarship and it would align with our strategic priority areas, so we'd be in with a good chance. And this is a project that's conducted in partnership with Australian National University, um, but also Griffith University. Um, so we've got quite a big team working on this project and, and in anyone interested in child and adolescent mental health and particularly how we can make that work with digital models in regional Australia, please reach out to me um, and um, find out more information in the booklet as well. So we're on to our final project and uh, I am going to hand over to Laura now for a little bit of a blurb on this project and then I'll, then I'll pop up the QR code where you can get information about the booklet and we can open up for some general questions as well. I appreciate that people might need to go. Um, are you there, Sonia? Still here, we can hear you. Sorry, yeah, my internet's cutting out right at this time. Hello, lovely to see you all. Um, thanks so much for squeezing our um, page in there too, Sonia. So I'm here presenting on behalf of the uh, evaluation team for the Seasons for Life um, post in Schools program. So that is Professor Miff Maple and Associate Professor Sarah Wayland, who are the chief investigators on this project. So I've just started um, as an ECR, kind of transitioning into that postdoc after my own PhD, um, which is specific to suicide prevention for young people in rural communities. So this um, Seasons for Life program is uh, run through the McKillip Family Services, who also funded the evaluation for this. Uh, so for the next two and a half years, we'll be evaluating the program across uh, 500 schools in Australia. And um, on top of my postdoc work that I'll be doing for this program, we'd really love um, some students to come on board and um, see what sort of projects, I guess, interest them. So what we're looking for is uh, students at all different levels. So we've kind of ticked all the boxes there. So we're interested in really finding people that are interested in this area and might have some skills that they can bring to it in terms of um, having that mental health, suicide prevention, um, professional academic uh, experience or an interest. It's really about having an interest in working in this suicide prevention space. So uh, different activities that can be undertaken through this project it just completely ranges, depends on what um, your interests are, the strengths that you can bring to the project. And it'll be things like mixed methodology, um, focus groups, interviews, um, and some quantitative data as well. I'd like to hear from anyone in this. Um, please feel free to email Miff, whose email is attached to the brochure and happy to also provide my email address if you want to talk more. Thank you, Laura. We might have missed just a little bit at the end there, but I think we got most of that. So all good. Yes, um, again, all the information is in, in the brochures that come with these projects. I'm just going to leave this up on the screen now and, and open up for general questions. Um, we have a, a, a large booklet that covers all of those projects. You can access it by clicking on the link, which I put in the chat or else scanning the, the QR code there. 
Um, and if you are able to answer a couple of questions in the survey, that will be wonderful. Um, please, anybody have any questions now? And I, and I appreciate we've hit two o'clock. So many good projects that we needed to, to talk about. But um, does anybody have any questions or for anyone on the Zoom? It's a lot to digest. So please feel free to go away and have a look at all of the um, the projects and the booklet that, that um, Ruthie or Liz will send to you and reach out. Each project has an email address at the bottom of it for you to, to contact and, and um, to email. Um, in, everybody on this Zoom call, um, including all of the MANA investigators, please could you also go on to this um, QR code and fill in the question as well? Um, just some of it might be irrelevant in terms of a, a collaboration and things like that as well. Lots of great projects. I'm just that, so thankful that everybody spent the time today to come and talk to you all. Um, and I think we'll continue to distribute that information, Liz and, and Ruthie, um, put it on the website, send it out to our mailing list. But please, when you have the booklet, do feel free to send that on to particularly our, our fourth year students and things like that as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Um, I'll stay on just a little bit longer in case people have some more questions, but otherwise have a wonderful day and wonderful weekend. Uh, Pearl, I see your question there. Some of these projects might be for um, next year, but some like the capstone projects might be able to be starting this year as well. And Miller, I forgot to thank you for all the hard work you did helping put the booklet and presentation together. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for hosting and yeah, presenting. Good. If there's any other questions, shout out. It's all good. We're here to here to chat. <laughs> Um, Ruthie, I'm going to send you through a final copy of that booklet as well because I just okay, made some changes just before this. Yeah. yeah. I'll, shall I send it through as a PDF or? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Cool. All right, then. Well, if there's oh, no other I'm questions. Oh, we've got one. recording. Yep, good. Thought you were going to ask me a question then, Ruthie. <laughs> <laughs>